According to a World Economic Forum Global Risk Report released earlier this year, South Africa has the third highest unemployment rate in the world for people between the age of 15 and 24. Too often, young people look at these stats and give up all hope. Sometimes, you just have to do it for yourself. This is Tonight. I'm Bruce Whitfield, and tonight we're discussing entrepreneurship. And this thing, it's not a condom the children can watch. It's okay. What it is, is a bath. You can use one of these sachets and bath your entire body. You'll be clean, you'll be sanitary, possibly more sanitary than you would under a cold tap. Joining me is the Woodkiz whiz kid inventor. Well, he was once a whiz kid. Now he's the tender age of 24. But Ludwig Marishane invented this product at the age of 17. He is the MD of Headboy Industries and he's with me in studio this evening. At 17, without a science lab at a rural in Pumalanga school, you invented this. Yes. How? Um, so it all started with a friend of mine who didn't want to bath. <laughs> it was winter in Limpopo, actually. So as I said, we're on the border of Mpumalanga and Limpopo. And he said, why doesn't somebody invent something you can put on your skin and you don't have to bath? At that point, I'd lost all my pocket money, which was about 50 rand a week, on different types of ideas and inventions that didn't work out. And I said, hey, next thing to try. And after six months of research on Google and Wikipedia, finally came up with a rudimentary formula that could actually work. So you used Google and Wikipedia, free resources available to anybody in the world online on what, a computer, in a science lab, in a computer lab? No, on my On a mobile phone. phone. Yeah, I mean, it's, it sounds very simplistic. I mean, mm -hmm. that was the, the beginning stages of the concept. It took a whole three years before I actually had enough money to make the prototype. So by the time we actually could afford to make the product after winning a few competitions, um, we made it. I was in my second year at UCT. Um, it performed, so the audio, it took away body odor, but the problem was it used to flake on the skin. Then we brought in Dr. Henny Duplessis, PhD chemistry with 20 years experience, sold him on the vision and the concept, became a shareholder, and now he focuses on developing the product even further and making it world class. But by the time you finally got this product, from the, your friend must have smelled really bad if he wasn't all that keen on bathing. Um, I mean, look, the bucket bathing method yeah. is how we stay clean in rural areas. Sure. That's how I, I stay clean my whole high school career. Having grown up in northern Joburg when I was in primary school and having baths every day, I mean, it was a huge shift. And that's how people stay clean every day. It's not the most dignified way. And in winter, it's actually yeah. the most irritating way to have to stay clean. So this is a convenience product that both the rich person and the poor person can use. But this is a revolution. I hope so. Why have I not seen it on a shelf in South Africa? I mean, uh, Besides the fact that I still had to stay in university and finish my degree, I couldn't just drop out when things got tough, um, we didn't have any funding. So we basically used business plan competitions as a way to fund the business. And for the past five years, we probably raised half a million rand, put that into the business just through competitions alone. We've never had to raise any uh, loans or get any funding from government, etc. We actually just wanted to refine our model and refine the product because it's actually a very difficult product to sell because you're literally trying to create a revolution. But now we believe we've got the model ready and we just need the funding and the access to markets to really make it fly. And the international market is loving it. But, but this is what's so interesting to me is that the international market is loving it. You've got, what, 90% of your sales don't happen where the stuff was invented. Yes, 90% of our sales are exported, 60% goes to the US market, 20% to Europe, and then the other 20% to Africa and Asia, the rest of the world, basically. But why has it not got the same traction here? Um, okay, so the initial research we, we, we figured out from customer feedback was, especially with the black community, ironically the community I created it for, um, we found that they had a psychological attachment to bathing. They grew up like me using the bucket bathing method. There's only now, one way to do it, now, with soap and water. Now I'm middle, I'm middle class, it's not even that, I'm middle class, I've got my geezer, I've got my hot water. I'm not trying to go back to, to, to those days. But what we then did was position it as a convenience product. You woke up, you're late for work, you woke up, you're going on a long distance trip, this is a product that can actually work for you. And ironically, using a product like this, or even just skipping bathing altogether once or twice a week is actually healthier for your skin. Ultimately, um, so I've heard, I'm not willing to risk it myself. But, but th this is taking huge traction overseas. So international markets are interested in it, mm -hmm. but you've not had the CSIR jumping on you. You've not had um, uh, local funders jumping upon, uh, on you. You've not had retailers saying, we'd like to carry some of these on our shelves and just see whether or not they move. That's actually what we're working on now is to try to get it on South African shelves and as a way to create demand or even market awareness, we've got a whole no bathing weekend going for <laughs> September. It's a global, global, global project. So basically corporates can come on board, sponsor a school with dry bath for 500 kids, 
they get dry bath for the no bathing weekend, you're saving 600,000 liters of water for every school that you sponsor with the dry bath. So even that alone is a whole a huge plus. And it's just to say, here's the product, try it out, see how it works for you, and then it'll be available on the shelf for you to buy afterwards. Is there, I mean, this, there's a Cape Union Mart model in this. I mean, these guys, this should be lying 20, 20 deep in Cape Union Mart. So we had a meeting with Cape Union Mart when mm -hmm. I was in my second year or third year at university, and they basically said, categorizing it th uh, as, a, as a hand sanitizer type of market. So looking at the hand sanitizers that they sell, they sell less than 400 units per year. So we said, look, it just doesn't make sense. The American camping market makes more sense for me to play online and just specifically market to those guys. And they're willing to pay 10 times the price that I'd be able to charge on Cape Union Mart without giving up the margin. Okay, so tell me how you're then getting attention overseas with, that you're not getting here. Well, the lucky thing is I'm young. So that's the youth aspect has really been working for me. Ironically, considering that I couldn't raise any funding or get support because I was young when I was- You're, you're 24 now, right? Yeah. And this was invented seven years ago. Yes. You were 17. Yes, so yeah. when I came up with the business plan, I think when I was in matric, I had a business plan that said I needed a million rand, applied for funding globally, and locally, only about 10 people bothered to reply back to me. Uh, half of them said, look, you're young, there's no way we're gonna give you a million, there's no way this thing's gonna work. And about three or four funds in Cape Town, ironically, said, look, we're not gonna give you the money, but we think what you're doing is great, so come have a cup of coffee if you have this side, and that's part of the reason why I ended up at UCT. Okay, so it did serve a purpose. You yeah. did get the education stuff sorted out, and that was all nice and formalized. People can take you a bit more seriously now, perhaps, than they might have a 17-year-old. But what was the driving ambition? Here, you're 17 years old. Yep, you're helping a mate out, but you're seeing an opportunity, and a matric in rural South Africa, drawing up a business plan in a school that doesn't have a chemical science lab, it doesn't have a computer lab, it doesn't have the luxury that you know, two Ks from here, kids are ignoring because they're a bit spoiled. Look, it's, it comes back to, I went to Maryville College in South Africa when I was in, sorry, in Johannesburg, when I was in grade eight. So I was a Catholic school, yeah. private school, just down the road. And part of the reason I moved back to Limpopo was my mom saying, look, it's unhealthy for you to be staying there. I moved back there and I think I regained the hunger, the hunger that Joburg just doesn't give you when you're a privileged middle-class child. And I think that was probably the biggest mistake, but best mistake yeah. I did was moving back and going to a place with all that lack of resources. I mean, I had to type my 40-page business plan on my cell phone just because I didn't have a computer. So the minute I got a laptop in uh, my first year at university, I had it with me like all the time, constantly refining the plan. Now, Jeff, uh, President Jacob Zuma has told us he's, he's created the Small Business Development Ministry. Do you see any hope coming through from the Small Business Development industry uh, Ministry? If there'd been one seven years ago, would your life be different today? Look, the biggest um, apprehension, I think, for small business in South Africa, in my personal experience, is the labor laws. It's not even about doing business in South Africa. What's your name? Herman Mashaba? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the labor laws. I mean, I've been complaining about it since day one, and I said, even with my business, the biggest fear wasn't, will I ever get funding? It wasn't, will our product pick up? It was, damn, the day I have to hire my first employee, because the laws in this country are literally screwing me. Sorry for the language. But essentially, well, you've got, you got to be truthful to that's, yourself. Yeah, and to that's our that's yes. for me the biggest frustration. I mean, we're working with this council called the Simodisa Council now. We at least have one victory with the export, uh, the, sorry, the currency control, the control okay. act with, uh, with regards to investing in South African companies as an international, et cetera. And now the next big hurdle is to say, can we please tear out the labor system and say, we've got a simpler labor system for small businesses. They can easily take in labor and take labor out. That's the biggest comprehension. I mean, how many small businesses in South Africa? Maybe a million. If you simplified the laws and each one of those people was comfortable enough to hire one person, that's a million jobs created. Like and there was no tax money that had to be given out. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't seem terribly complicated, but we are stuck in bureaucracy and we're stuck in ideology, which is restrictive. If 90% of your sales of this stuff are happening outside of the country, how long do you stay here before you go, you know what, my market is elsewhere, I'm going to follow my market? I mean, probably the only reason I haven't left is because I love this country so much. Um, I've been to a couple of European countries and I say, look, things work but South Africa is just the land of opportunity. That's probably the only reason I've stayed here so long. But how is my long? love for the country. But if it starts killing my business, then it's something I really have to reevaluate. I mean, if my market is in America, why, why am I not in America? What, is, what needs to happen here for you to stay? Just allow entrepreneurs, it's not even about me, that's the thing. It's I can't even groom young guys to take over the business or push the business forward just because the environment is not conducive for that. If anything, I would love the system 
to allow more young entrepreneurs more opportunity to do more great things. You've succeeded yeah. in a system that is prohibits the opportunity you talk about. How do you do it where millions of others couldn't be bothered? What drives you to succeed despite the obstacles? Because I'm just very hungry. <laughs> I am very hungry. I still have to build my mom a house. I still don't even have a car yet. So that's mm -hmm. still something I need to do. So there's still a lot to be done in, in my personal capacity. The motivation and the drive comes more from the upraising that I've had. And I always say my dad abused me with books. When I was in grade two, grade three, I had to do reports at 7 p.m. every night to say, what I learned before break time, what I learned after break time, what I learned after I got back from school, the extra homework that I had to do after school, do my reading, do my spelling. And he did that to me until I got straight A's in grade four. And then he said, look, now the drive has to come from you. And I think the, the, the seed was planted and it's growing very strong. What does your dad do? He's an HR. He's at the Chamber of Minds. He's the head of learning. Okay. And the point is, but he gave you that motivation. He gave you those skills. He gave you the energy and the drive to do it. You've done it yourself. But there are a million other people who might have a bright idea who are not going to be bothered. You need, they need to be freed up to bother. Yeah. Um, I was actually discussing it on Radio 2000 that the biggest issue I see is not even a government issue. It's, we know how we had the Truth and Reconciliation yeah. Commission to try to repair the relations between the previous generation. I feel like we need that same truth and reconciliation type of commission for the, today's current youth, where the youth with and the youth without can just voice the things that they're really struggling with to each other just to develop a level of understanding because the truth is the people with or the young people with are trying to find ways to make value or provide value to the people without, but there's no relation between the two. There's no platform or situation where they can get together and share experiences and say, this is where I come from, these are the things that bother me, these are the things I worry about, how can we get together and besides our economic, socioeconomic differences, get something going. What a guy. Thank you so much for coming Thank in and sharing so the story. Ludwig Mareshane, the co-founder and MD of Headboy Industries. Very simple. Elon Musk's ideas are a bit more complicated, but Elon Musk has taken his intellectual property elsewhere and is making himself globally famous as a result of blowing the minds of Americans. Let's hope that Ludwig doesn't feel the need to do the same thing and his place in South Africa is enabled through a little less constraint. Thank you for watching. There'll be more tonight tomorrow. Till then, bye-bye.